large adducts. So these large adducts, such as UV, they distort the DNA helix structure, and that is flagged by, uh, oh no, that's not true, sorry. TCNER, <laughs> that's for GGNER. Uh, TCNER removes these adducts when these adducts are encountered during transcription. So if a DNA strand is used for the synthesis of messenger RNA or other RNA, um, and then it is, re uh, it removes the adduct. So adducts that are on the strand, DNA strand that is used as template for transcription are removed. As a result, we see way less mutations of, uh, on, on uh, resulting from adducts on the transcribed strand. And we see that back in the signature. So if we look, for example, at the mutation signature of UV, signature 7, we see that UV adducts cytosines. So we see many more adducts, uh, many more mutations from cytosines if the cytosine was not on the strand that was used for transcription. Right? Uh, so this is something we see in the mutation signatures. So to go uh, one step up again, so mutational signatures are used for a couple of purposes, right? So uh, we use them for prevention and screening uh, to figure out what happened in the life of the cancer, so what caused the cancer, and also to study DNA damage and repair. Um, and we find them either from tumors or from experimental data. I will focus mainly on the experimental data a bit later. Um, so just to go through those applications of mutational signatures, um, one very uh, good example is erisoleic acid. Um, so erisoleic acid is a compound that sometimes is found in traditional medicines. And this is actually preventable, right? So the presence of the erisoleic acid mutational signature in tumors shows that there are still patients and we actually found this nearly worldwide. So the prevalence is most common in Taiwan and China, but we actually see some patients in North America and even one patient in Brazil who are exposed to erisoleic acid. So this shows that there are still people getting exposed to erisoleic acid. So this knowledge can inform people that they shouldn't be eating this or should be working harder to avoid it. Another example is colobectin. So colobectin is a compound produced by bacteria producing, uh, carrying the PKS gene island. And this colobectin mutagenesis has mainly been observed in the colon, but we also recently reported it in an oral squamous cell carcinoma, right? Um, this was in a patient who presented with a very strong bacterial infection in the mouth. And in hindsight, right, if this patient had practiced better oral hygiene, in other words, brushed their teeth a bit better, it is very likely that this cancer could have been preventable. Uh, another application of mutation signature is to figure out what happened during the life of this tumor. Um, examples, right? So we are, have a few examples of mutations which are strongly associated with certain mutagenic processes. Um, to human liver tumors that have been exposed to aflatoxin B1 are strongly enriched for a very specific P53 mutation, P53R249S. Uh, tumors exposed, uh, tumors with mat uh, mat OH deficiency uh, have specific KRS mutations and the third promoter mutation that you might have heard of is actually a perfect fit for the main mutation type associated with UV exposure. And this third mutation is also extremely prevalent in melanomas. Um, uh, besides that, mutation signatures can also shed light on how DNA damage and repair function. Uh, there was a very recent paper by Nadesna Volkova um, showing that if you mess with DNA repair, you actually affect the mutation signature. 
Uh, there's a plot from her paper here. So she has cells which she exposes to EMS, which is a, a highly mutagenic agent. And she has wild type cells and cells that are um, deficient for polymerase kappa. And you see that if she knocks out polymerase kappa, the mutagenesis level of C to T mutations doesn't really change because you see the Y axis is the same. Um, but suddenly there are adducts on, uh, there are mutations from T to A and T to C. That suggests that the EMS adduct, right, is somehow cleared up by uh, polymerase, uh, by, by polymerase kappa in the wild type cells, but the mutations persist in the pol kappa negative cells, right? But pol kappa apparently is only involved in the repair or the translate synthesis over adducts on thymines or adenines because the site C mutations are not affected. Um, the last um, application I want to discuss is the therapeutic opportunities, which I think might be of interest to people. Um, a very famous one is uh, BRCA-ness, so homologous repair deficiency. We all know that patients with BRCA mutations show high levels of mutagenesis and recombination, and they're also extremely sensitive to PARP inhibitors. So detection of mutational process associated with uh, BRCA deficiency, which is single base per substitution three, but there's also uh, indels, highly specific indels with microhomology that are associated with bracha -ness. And so uh, Helen Davies uh, published this tool called HR Detect to evaluate this, which is used, proposed to be used as a predictor for clinical response to PARP inhibition. Second example, is, uh, is the top 2 a mutational signature that was described. Um, this top 2 a mutational signature is the result of trapped top 2 cleavage complexes and experimental data in, in yeast has shown that if you have this trapping of top 2 cleavage complexes, you might actually be extra sensitive to top 2 inhibitors such as etoposide. Moving on. Um, so, we study mutational signatures mainly in cancer, but they're also very relevant for normal tissues. Um, uh, Inigo Martorena was uh, the, the first one to, to uh, really make this point. Uh, so he studied mutagenesis in eyelids from healthy individuals who had eyelid corrective surgery. And he took these eyelids and he punched out very small sections and he sequenced those and what he found is that this mutagenesis that he found oncogenic mutations in all cells but no not in all cells in most cells right and there's a recent paper by Colomadal uh, who showed that mutagenesis is very common in normal cells and you have this clonal selection but these clones they keep each other in check right so they all stay roughly the same size so they have this um, uh, a competition for space. Um, but, right, so this, this shows that this mutagenesis in normal cells and only one single thing has to go wrong to get a tumor. Um, the fact that mutagenesis is a common in normal cells makes it very interesting for mutational signature research also because it gives rise to questions, right? So how much mutagenesis can you have before it turns into a tumor? Um, and which mutagenic processes are more or less likely to result in tumor genesis? Um, so uh, like I said, we were going to talk about experimental delineation of mutational signatures. And the most important reasons to study mutational signatures are, of course, we want to find new mutational signatures. Um, that uh, uh, is, of course, to identify new uh, things that cause cancer so we can tell people not to do that anymore. Um, benefit of experimental signatures also that it's, it's clean, but uh, maybe one of the most important things, right? So finding novel mutational signatures might be possible 
but we have a certain set of signatures which is known now, um, but for which no etiolo etiology is established yet. So the biggest point we want to, uh, what I want to say, um, right? What we want to do is explain these mutational signatures. And this is, this is very important, right? So we have mutational signatures that are extracted from human tumors, right? As I said before, there's about 60 uh, mutational signatures known now. <clears throat> but those are all uh, extracted from human tumors. And if you don't know for sure that what the biological background for them is, we cannot be absolutely sure that these signatures are correct and biologically relevant. Um, so to study mutation signatures in vitro, there's basically three approaches. So either you do prolonged exposure. This is the pro approach we used for our uh, uh, paper uh, discovering the cisplatin mutation signature. So we take uh, immortal cell lines. We grow them in the presence of a mutagen for a long time. In our case, we use two months. And then we do some sorting to get a single cell. So the mutations is present, uh, are present in all cells in our clone. Because if you have a very heterogeneous population with the current sequencing technologies, you wouldn't be able to detect the mutation. Alternatively, you can also use the MEF system. These are not immortal, but you can mutinize them for a prolonged period of time, a couple of weeks, and they go through a crisis and they naturally create clones. Uh, the second approach is uh, uh, doing a short shotgun uh, exposure. Uh, biggest example there is the, the paper from Joe Kuka, who used uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, Obvious downside is that if you have a very short exposure, then you don't give time for mutations to accumulate. And the last uh, example is in vivo exposure. So there's a couple of systems. Um, so there are papers on, on in C. elegans. So these is uh, these are worms, and they expose these worms for 20 generations. The restriction there is that you only get a mutation in the next generation if you manage to mutate the germline. Alternatively, you can also expose mice, but that's of course logistically much more challenging. Um, one thing I have to say is that whatever model you use, make sure that your DNA repair status is normal. So this is an example. So this is the suspected mutation null signature published in C. elegans. So all these are, are normal worms and you see they have very strong C to T peaks. Whereas in the humans, so we used MCFTNA, which is a normal ductal epithelial cell line and HEPG2, a heptoblastoma cell line. Uh, we saw mostly C to T mutations, T to A mutations, and some C to T, uh, C to A mutations. But as you see, this C to A peak is actually not the same as the peak in the C elegans. Right, so I labeled them so you can see actually these C to A peaks in C elegans are the same peaks uh, in the humans, but then in the humans there are C to T mutations. So we suspect that the C. elegans DNA repair works slightly differently, where translation synthesis incorporates adenines instead of thymines. Right? So if you're going to use a non-human model, please ensure that the DNA repair status is, is correct, right? So you see in C. elegans that the right peaks are there, but there's clearly a bias there for ending incorporation instead of timing incorporation. So, of course, right, so I said we do a two-month exposure. That means that these cell lines are growing and dividing for two months. So our cell lines have a doubling time of about two days, which means that after two months we have roughly 50 to 60 populations, uh, population cycles. During every one of those cell divisions, mutations can occur. 
thus we have a background, right? Similarly, in the short-term exposure of uh, that uh, Joe Kuka did with her IPSCs, which was only a shotgun exposure, one exposure, and after a week she, she did cloning, she still got a background, right? So any experimental system always has a background, and we can't really do NMF on these experimental samples because the numbers are not high enough. So there's a challenge to remove this background. So I took this illustration from the from Jill's paper, right? So there's a challenge with est establishing mutational signature background. So Jill has a very stable mutational signature, background mutational signature. Then she has a spectrum in her final samples. And then the challenge is to remove the background mutational pattern from the mutational process she's actually interested in. Interestingly, if you look at the background in different models, so this is the background mutational pattern that Jill found. So you have a fairly low number of mutation, but it's extremely stable. So nearly every one of her clones showed this highly spiky C2A mutation pattern. So this is specific to the iPSCs that she used. On the other hand, in the HEPG2 cells and MCFDNA cells we use, we get a much more flat background mutational pattern. But you see that also between those two differentiated human cells, you have a different in background, right? So you see, for example, HEPG2 has much more C2A background than MCFDNA. And MCFDNA has more C2, uh, T2C mutations. <laughs> right? Um, so a complication is, right, how do you determine how much of your spectrum is background? Right? So we have, right, both Jill's paper and our uh, data show there is some variability, but usually the background is fairly stable. So we can try to subtract the background, and we will actually be doing that in the practicum to show you how it's done. Um, there is one more complicated issue which is present if you do long-term exposure, uh, which is that if you see a uh, mutagenesis in one of your exposed clones which has very high background, or if your mutational signature of interest looks like the background, are you going to be able to differentiate it? So when can you be sure that you're looking at actual mitigenesis and not just high background, right? So conceptually, this is something that we're still struggling with. Um, okay, so back to mutational signatures. Um, mutational signatures are usually displayed a, relative to the human genome abundance. So they are the proportions of every peak in the mutational signature as you would see them if you sequence a whole human genome, right? Well, you have to take into account that the trinucleotides are not evenly distributed over the genome. Uh, sorry, they are evenly distributed. They're not present in even amounts, right? So if you see in a spectrum, so this is obviously, it has never occurred to me, but Imagine you have a spectrum where you have a thousand mutations in absolutely every peak. That does not mean that every type of trinucleotide is e equally likely to get mutated as in this tumor. Because if you convert to the mutations per million trinucleotides that are mutated, you see these strong peaks coming up. These are CPG sites. So CPGs are strongly depleted in the human genome. <coughs> And as a result, right, if you sequence a human genome and you get a very low peak of CPGs, that doesn't mean CPGs don't get mutated, it just means there's less CPGs to measure, right? So this is, of course, a, a very extreme example, which is not really biologically plausible, but this is very important if you analyze whole exome sequencing data. So, uh, the human and the mouse exome also is relative to human genome, strongly enriched for CPGs. So if you compare exome data to human data and you don't take into account the trinucleotide abundance, you will see a lot of CPG mutations 
in the exomes compared to the genomes. Yes, that's what I just said. Um, right, and you have to take into account also this trinucleotide abundance when you make your conclusions, right? So if you want to make a conclusion about which site in a gene, for example, is more likely to be mutated as a result of certain mutational process, you have to think in terms of the density, so the mutations per million trinucleotide, instead of the counts that you see in the tumor, right? I illustrate that here with the cisplatin mutation signature. So if you look at the counts, you would say that CCC trinucleotides are just about equally likely to be mutated uh, as CCT trinucleotides. But if you take into account the trinucleotide abundance, right, the fact that there's just many more CCT trinucleotides in the human genome than CCC trinucleotide, right, it's about a twofold difference, <laughs> then you uh, suddenly see that CCC trinucleotides are actually much more likely to get mutated than CCT trinucleotides, right? So depending on the question you want to answer, right? So if you want to talk about whether certain mutations are likely to occur by a mutation signature, for example, you have to take into account how often does it even, does that trinucleotide occur in the genome when you look at the signature? Right, um, so um, just some conceptual questions uh, when you do experiments, right? So experiments, uh, of course, need to model biology, but uh, we are, of course, limited by the experimental models, right? Uh, I have talked about, for example, aflatoxin. Aflatoxin, as you find it, as, as it is excreted by fungi, is not, is not reactive. Right, it is inert. It will not add it to your DNA unless it gets metabolized by the cell. That means that if you use a cell line model which does not express the enzymes required for this, you will not get mutations, of course. Right? Uh, a second thing that an experiment generally does not model is the tis tissue distribution. Right? Um, if you eat aflatoxin, right? It has a certain route through the body, right? So we use, for example, MCF10A cells, which are normal breast ductal epithelium. And we can, of course, expose them to aflatoxin and we can make sure they metabolize it. But that doesn't mean that you should expect those mutations in normal breast tissue, because in, if you eat it, it doesn't go near your breast cells, right? Um, mutagenesis sometimes needs a push, right? Aflatoxin is known to mutate liver cells, and this is true, but these mutations can only occur if the liver cells are actually dividing. Because in normal, healthy adults, liver cells are dormant. They sit there and do their job, but they don't really divide very much. And like I said, you can get an addict on the DNA, but if there's no cell division, you will never get a mutation. Uh, in the case of aflatoxin, it is well known that if you have a hepatitis infection, aflatoxin is much more likely to uh, cause cancer than if you don't have hepatitis. Uh, so I should rephrase that, I guess. Aflatoxin synergizes with hepatitis to cause liver cancer. Um, and of course, for example, erisoleic acid, it is possible that in the tumors we have detected with aflatoxin, uh, with erisoleic acid mutagenesis, um, are probably from patients that have been exposed to erisologic acid for 20 years. Uh, I think you can imagine that we prefer not to do experiments that last 20 years before we get results. So this low, low exposure for a long, long time is not something we can model very much. We do have to keep that in mind because we do fairly high exposures, which of course could have an effect on DNA repair, right? We could overwhelm DNA repair. And that could actually change the shape of the signature. 
right? Like I said, you can't perfectly model and thus predict mutagenicity in, in, uh, in vivo. Um, sometimes the experimental data doesn't match the tumor data. Uh, going back to the cisplatin signature, right? So we have two cell lines with exposed to cisplatin, MCF10A and HEPG2, and they look fairly similar. But in the PGOC analysis, they actually found two signatures which look fairly similar. And you can see they both have this T2A thing, which kind of looks like the T2A we see in our cell lines. These C2T peaks are, are clearly the same. The C2A looks slightly different. So you see this main peak here, C2A is CCTT, which is not that prominent in our cell line data, whereas the most prominent peak in our cell line data is not really found is not that prominent in the uh, tumor data. So then the question is, is this true biologically? This is one of the questions we will also try to address during the, during the practicum. So um, some takeaway points. Mutational signatures can offer insight into the mutational processes underlying cancer, uh, mutagenesis and DNA repair, and they might be important in the future for deciding treatment strategies. For example, the BRCAN is uh, being indicative of sensitivity to PARP inhibitors, or the top 2A mutation being predictive of sensitivity to top isomerase inhibitors. Uh, experimental work can provide important insights into DNA repair. So figuring out how certain adducts are processed or what goes wrong in certain cells uh, in, 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 in tumor well, or normal cells that leads to mutagenic processes. Um, important thing is that will also come, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure Steve will mention this also, but it's important that we make sure that the results we get are biologically plausible, right? We can make a signature that consists of 96, uh, we can make 96 signatures consisting of a single peak and get perfect reconstruction of patient tumors, um, but that won't tell us anything about the biology, right? So mutation signatures are tools to understand the biology and it's not just a mathematical exercise. I think that's my talk for today. So I'd like everybody to remind everybody to please join Slack. Uh, if there's questions, Steve, are you still here? Do you want to moderate? I'm muted, but I am here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, now I am unmuted. Uh, yeah, so there are quite a few Slack, Slack questions which I've been trying to respond to uh, as you've been talking. Um, I okay. think I would like to actually summarize some of them because I think some were... Uh, yeah, maybe you can, we can just cover them. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, let's see, going back to about nine. Well, so depending on what time zone you're in. Um, read, read one out, uh, maybe. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, David asked, are these mutations across the entire genome? And uh, yes, these are mutations across the entire genome, or if we only sequenced an exome across the, ex across the entire exome. At this point, we do, yeah. So it is important to keep in mind that mutational signatures are not just damaging mutations, right? These are all mutations that occur because we do not, right? We want to map the mutational process and not, the, uh, not just the damaging mutations because then we could get affected by biological selection pressure, right? And also we have, right? So there are mutations across the entire genome, but not all regions of the human genome are equally likely to get mutated due to genome conformation. Yeah, good. Right. Um, yeah, so this is something that, uh, so most of the people doing cancer genomics are so focused on trying to understand how the mutations cause cancer and what mutations cause cancer it's a little bit hard to shift perspective and think about what's causing the mutations, right? So we're mostly focused about what's causing the mutations, right? 
of course, but at a certain level, we want to know the other question, the answer to the other question, but, right. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. So you, right. So we want to understand what caused the mutation and therefore what contributes to, contributes to cancer. But right, the other yeah. fact that, that coin is that if you know what the mutational process looks like, you can kind of also see how it affects the tumor, right? How the tumor is changed. Yeah. Uh, so Ahmed also uh, says, okay, it's location agnostic. Am I right? Uh, yes. And then the second part of the question is, is, is this a new way of associating mutations to diseases? Um, I'm not fully sure I... I, I... I took a stab. I mean, basically, uh, it's not really a way to try to associate mutations with diseases. We're really focusing on what's causing the mutations, not whether or not the mutations are causing diseases. And so that's, that's the, the basic way to think about it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, then uh, Farzan asked about, uh, let's see, uh, where did that go? Yeah, how significantly can a single mutation affect the gene's functionality? Extremely dramatically, right? So hotspot mutations, right? So you can have a single mutation that creates a stop codon at the third amino acid, for example, and then the whole protein effectively disappears, right? Uh, you can have a indel, a small deletion of one or two base pairs. This would cause a frame shift, right? So you know that every three base pairs encodes an amino acid. So if you get one or two base pair insertion or deletion, those three bases, they shift. Right, and then the whole gene encoding is messed up, right? Uh, there's actually also very small changes like the BRAF mutation, BRAF V600E. It's a very simple T2A mutation, it's one base pair. It causes a very slight uh, conformational change in the, mm -hmm. in the BRAF protein, which causes it uh, to be constitutively active, right? So, instead of needing a cue from outside to go do something, now it always works, right? This can have extremely dramatic effects on the cell, right? So in, that, for, in the case of BRAF, right, the, the effect on the protein itself is not that big, but the consequences for the cell are gigantic. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, Apijit asked about what is the minimum minimum WGS coverage needed to confidently predict these signatures? So that's, that's an interesting question. And there, there's lots of different approaches to do this, right? So there are also people who are doing very shallow sequencing. And right, as long as you sequence enough of the DNA, you can always do a, do a mutational signature. Right, of course, the more coverage you have, the more confidence you have in your individual mutations. But right? the question is, do you really need to have a very high confidence of individual mutations if you want to do a mutation signature? I think some people would argue not. So there's different approaches here. We usually do like 30X, which is plenty, right? But the question is also, right, is your tumor pure or not, right? And so, right, is, is your tumor purely clonal or do you have like 10% tumor cells and 90% surrounding normal tissue, right? This, there's a lot of variables there. So this very much depends on your sample and your research question. Okay, good. And um, let's see, um, the oops, it just bounced, hold on. Um, uh, sorry, uh, so it just bounced. The, I lost track of where I was because it bounced. Okay, um, uh, Julian or Julian asked, um, what's the rationale for the 96 trinucleotide representation for single nucleotide substitutions. I understand that it aims to provide context by considering one nucleotide before and after, but it hasn't been shown to be the optimal, in quotes, you, you know, pointing out, of course, that that's an ill-defined term, and opt, has, it, has, it, has it turned out to be an optimal representation? So there, there's, of course, pros and cons, right? So ideally, you'd look further 
The problem that is that if you look further, right? So sometimes if we have enough mutations, we look at two bases in front and two base pairs after the mutation site. In total, you do it then have 1536 different types of mutations. Uh, as you might, uh, might imagine, um, those, uh, right? If you have 1536 channels and you have a tumor with 500 mutations, you're just going to be looking at noise, right? Unless it's a very spiky event, you're just going to look at noise. And we have seen that for most mutation signatures, there is some information in the 1536 spectrum, but not as much as in the 96 spectrum. There are examples, right? So there's the colobectin mutation signature is a very striking example, which has a nearly 100% adenines three base pairs, five prime of timing mutations, right? But that means, right, you'd have to look three base pairs in front, right? So if you want to do that plotting generically, you have to look at hexanucleotides. The amount of channels you need then is way too many. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so with, with the amount of mutations we have at this point, that is basically not feasible. And for a single tumor, I don't think that will ever be feasible. Right? If you have thousands and thousands and thousands of whole genome sequence, you might get signature extractions, but the signature assignment will I, not ever be feasible, I think. Yeah. Uh, so Julianne also sort of followed up about any references on this. Um, I don't know if anybody's really, it's more sort of the field has looked at, so certainly the Alexandra paper that we worked on we looked at 1536 and everything and concluded that it didn't add enough in most situations to make it worthwhile looking at for all the reasons that, that you discussed. I don't think there's any reference uh, that actually uh, has, has looked at this question and really has actually uh, posed the question, but we certainly in the Peacock paper, the Alexandrov 2020 paper looked at everything in 1536 included and concluded that it didn't provide enough information to, to make it justifiable and to make it worthwhile in most cases. Very, very often it just doesn't add more information. So then it's yeah. easier to stay with 96 also because you, yeah. you just get more, you, you have essentially less noise, right? It's more stable. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so David uh, sent a question about uh, are these single base substitutions and I think I responded that they're single base pair substitutions in the context of the preceding and following bases. I think uh, you can, uh, David, yes. do you have any more? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's the classical mutational signature, right? So you just represent six types of mutations, right? Cytosine to ending guanine or thymine and thymine to ending cytosine and guanine. Right, that's because we compress them because a G to T mutation is the same as a C to A mutation. Right, so those are the six basic single base pair substitutions. And we plot them in trying to put that context, so one base pair in front and one base pair after. Okay. Uh, then another question from Denise is, what is the relationship between mutational signatures and the driver slash passenger mutations talked about in cancer genomics? I would say that they are fairly unrelated. So like we said, mutational signatures are all the mutations in the, in the genome that we detect. Um, and so they're also intergenic. They're in, in gene deserts. They are silent mutations that don't affect proteins, right? So these are nearly all passengers, 99.99%. So mutation signatures themselves are not really a mechanism to study drivers. But like I said, there are known driver genes which associate with certain mutagenic processes. Yeah. So allow me, another... allow me to say, allow me to say that uh, from the point of view of driver discovery, it's it's important to be aware of the of the background mutagenesis. Yeah. And um, from, from that perspective, it's, uh, it may be relevant uh, because we want to get rid of um, signals that come about just by chance and we want to capture positive selection. So as, as regards uh, correctly elucidating um, 
uh, background mutagenesis in the sense of uh, what is the uh, what is the mutagenesis present in the in the normal cells of the tissue? Uh, it is relevant. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's very good. Yeah, so this is mostly upstream of identifying drivers, right? So yeah. this ties into the theme that we're, we want to know what damages the our, mo our main focus is what's damaging the d DNA. Most of the damaged DNA is not driving, okay? Mm -hmm. But to, uh, sometimes to identify drivers, it's very useful to know what kind of mutations are occurring because to understand if, uh, so basically finding a, a cancer driver gene is really easy, right? All you have to do is find a gene at a site that's mutated above what you would expect by chance, right? The problem is defining what you would expect by chance, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand the mutational signatures to be able to define what you would expect by chance, right? And that's, that's not so easy, right? Um, I'll try to respond in the, in the thread in, in a little bit, um, a little bit more fully uh, to summarize our conversation. Um, Doris uh, asked about um, in the indel signatures up to which length are plus five base pair indels monitored? So I think it's a question about the, the, most the are, colors. Yeah. Uh, they, they call small insertions and deletions up to 50 base pairs, right? So these are events that can still be detected based on the short sequencing that nearly everyone does, right? So this is a technical thing, right? If you have a 200 base pair event, then with 100, 100 or 150 base pair Sequencing read is very difficult to detect those unless you go to like overlapping reads with the, the breakpoints and stuff, right? So then you get, need completely different algorithms. So these small insertions and deletions are generally up to 50 base pairs. Okay, uh, then, um, okay, uh, Sachendra asked, um, Okay, could please explain again background mutations and trinucleotide abundance? Um, those are two unrelated things. Uh, Satendra, do you wanna clarify or? Yeah, can you please just give a little bit more detail what your, what's unclear? Uh, I was, yeah, Satendra. Yes. So I was asking for uh, is background mutations are those mutations which occurred in the normal cells or it's a something different. I missed the point actually. Okay. So, so what the, is background? Uh -huh. The background we were talking about here is in experimental systems and they are the mutations that occur randomly during cell division. So the most common background like process in tumors we see are signatures one and five. So those, right? So signature one is spontaneous deamination of CPGs. And signature five is a mutational process that is seen in 99% of all tumors. So this, these reflect processes which are ongoing in basically every cell. So these are probably either endogenous damages due, due to metabolites in the cell, which are in every cell, or they are polymerase mistakes during cell DNA duplication prior to cell division, right? This same sort of background mutagenesis also occurs in experimental systems, right? So we expose for two months and during those two months, the cells keep dividing, thus there are background mutations accumulating. But the background I was referring to is that experimental background which is basically mutations that occur due to cell division that occur spontaneously while I'm exposing to something that I expect to cause mutation, right? So in the end, I sequence my clone and there's two processes that are mixed, right? So there's my true mutagenesis caused by my mutagen, plus there's the mutations that randomly occurred because my cells were alive and dividing. Does that clarify? Yeah. Uh, thanks. And second is the trinucleotide uh, abundance. 
Yes. Right. Could you hear okay, Anna? Yeah. So trinucleotide abundance meaning why trinucleotide? Why not to dinucleotide or tetra? So I was talking about trinucleotide abundance because I was talking about the single base pair substitutions, which we plot in trinucleotide context, right? So if we go. Uh, here, right? So this is uh, a plot in trinucleotide abundance, right? So if we want to look at this peak, for example, right? So this is a C to T mutation with a G preceding and an A following. So it's a G, C, A to a G, C, uh, to a G, T, A mutation, right? If I want to then see what the mutations per million trinucleotide is, right? I, I compensate for how many GCA trinucleotides there are in the genome to start with. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I was a little distracted, Arna. Did you point out that CP, CGs are very rare in the genome as a whole? And yeah. so, yeah. Right. I'm sorry, I was, just, I was looking at other emails, but yeah. Yeah, that's a getting word. Right, I try to illustrate that here, uh, more clear maybe here. So here I didn't point out the CPGs, right? So here I focused on the fact that CCC trinucleotides are less abundant than CCT trinucleotides. So if you look in mutations per million, so in density space, you see that CCCs are much more likely to be mutated than CCTs. But at the same time, right, in between, right, this is a CCG to CTG mutation. So this is in a CPG, right? So it's CCG. And you can see if you look at density, right? In the count spot, it looks that like CCG to CTG mutations are fairly rare. But if you take into account that CPGs are so rare in the genome, you actually see that they're relatively common. It's actually the third most common C to T mutation, right? Which you wouldn't see here, but here, you see that they're very common. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Um, uh, actually, Farron, could you take a look in the uh, Slack and make sure that when I'm replying to people, like I replied to Doris Chen a minute ago, could you make sure that reply is visible to you? I see a reply to Doris Chen. Okay, that's good, yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't going to some private channel, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, then Denise asked, um, how do you capture the mutational signatures of non-coding mutations which only affect gene expression or promoter methylation? What does a mutational process mean in this case? So a mutational process that we are looking at for mutational signatures is irrespective of functional consequences, right? So mutations in promoters of course occur for example the promoter mutations in in in, in ter, uh, the ter promoter very famous but two mutation signature research is just one of the mutations right so these mutations add something but we don't really care about the functionality of them right. so there could be some mechanistic things whereby mutation signatures work differently in different parts of the genome, right? But yeah, right. So that's I think I think I kind of preluded on that earlier by yeah. saying right, so the, we look at mutations of the whole genome, but not the entire genome is mutated evenly. This yeah, that's right. Yeah, confirmed in confirmation and all sorts of complicated things. Uh, I think Fran will actually cover that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so right. we will look at the genomic landscape. Right. So we will right. probably. But I think the point is we don't care if a, for signature analysis at this point, we don't care if the mutation affects gene expression. Yes. We don't affect, care if it affects the amino acid sequence. Um, uh, we don't care if it affects promoter methylation. We really, we, you know, we only care about, it. so just to make it very black and white, over, oversimplify it a bit, we only care about what damaged the DNA. We don't care about what the damaged DNA does to the cell, right? That's a, to overstate the case a bit, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, 
Abhijit asked, are, are these signature also include SNPs? Um, so the, the, the definition of a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, which means it is a variant that occurs in 1% of the population or more, right? Uh, there are databases full of SNPs like dbSNP uh, and there's like the exec and the thousand genomes, right? So they map common variants in the human genome. And we actually use those as filters to remove them, right? So we want to be sure that the mutations that we look at are somatic mutations. So they are mutations that are not germline and that occurred only during the process of tumor formation or before that, right? So that's also fine. So we actually actively remove SNPs because we don't want what we call germline leakage in our signal. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so Julian says counting substitutions across the genome or exome implies that they may occur with equal probability anywhere. Is that reasonable from a biological standpoint? Wouldn't chromatin accessibility change dramatically to the exposed DNA regions? Yes, so this is very true, right? So there are really regions of the genome which are more prone to mutagenesis than other regions, right? This is not, these are not 50 fold differences, but there are clear differences. Um, we also actually, right, we have looked and we have not seen that the mutational signature itself really substantially changes in different regions of the genome. So the mutations that do occur they, in terms of mutational signature, they still look the same as whether they're in a genome or an exome, for example. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Peter uh, Petar asks if, um, do you always have to sequence DNA from healthy tissue blood if you want to find mutation signature from a single tumor? Um, if you want to do it right, I would say yes, but sometimes it's not possible, of course. Um, sometimes we, if, if it's possible, we use two tumors, right? This is possible if we know for sure that two tumors are independent lesions from the same patients. Uh, we can use one tumor as a, to correct for the germline of the other tumor. Alternatively, you can do stringent filtering, trying to remove variants that are likely germline by, for example, looking at only at variants that are not 100% or 50%, for example, and removing variants in germline SNP databases such as the thousand genomes. It's possible. Usually you don't get a very clean signal if you do that, but it's workable. And then um, so people, a few people have chatted into the... Uh, okay. um, uh, so, Emily, do you mind if I ask your question? I presume you don't mind. Uh, okay. No. Okay, yeah. So try to find the Slack channel. Um, but Emily, and I'll copy yours into the Slack channel. Uh, Emily asks, how do you define background mutations for leukemia patient uh, PB, uh, PBMC data? Uh, how, what do you do for leukemia? Um, I think my question is similar to the previous um, one and the gentleman asked about the background um, for leukemia patients is that we should, it's, it, it's hard to, to, to get their blood before they know they had leukemia. So yes. um, I was just asking like what, uh, and usually for solid tumor, people use the PBMC as the background. And but in this case, the PBMC itself is um, had, um, yeah, is a tissue, yeah. Uh, tumor tissue. So, I, so we're I, just wondering what should we yeah. go to like use um, blood banks and so called no. healthy or, or thousand Fibro yeah. probably fibroblasts. Yes. So I had read papers where they have used skin samples. So you as normal control. Okay. So for the same patients, we get their, their skin samples. Yeah, right. So there are databases with SNPs to remove germline variants, right? But they're not ex that extensive, right? There's still quite a bit of variants left after that. Mm -hmm. So it, it really helps a lot if you have, an, uh, have a paired sample from the same individual. So for leukemia, uh, a skin sample would be a good alternative. 
I see. I see. So, so if um, they already collected the samples, then what would be the um, less optimal um, than skin sample? So you can do variant calling on only one tumor, right? Uh -huh. And then, then try to remove likely germline variants by looking at the variant allele frequency. Um, if you have a large population, you could actually also look for variants that are shared between all your tumors, right? So if you have a specific population, say uh, Ashkenazi Jew population, and you have sequenced 20 individuals, right? You can use those 20 individuals as, as like a panel of normals. And then you can say that any variant that is present in two or more of those tumors is likely germline because it's present too often in the population. I see. Right? So there, there are tricks to, to remove or to try to remove more. But the, right? the, the VAF is important. The variant allele frequency is maybe your bet, depending on the biology of the tumor, of the leukemia. So, uh, it, I, I, it would depend on the kind of leukemia if you can mm -hmm. use variant allele frequency as a filter. I see. I yeah. see. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, there's a couple. Um, uh, Catherine, you had a question that you posted to the Zoom privately also. Um, I presume it's okay if I ask the question. That, so the question is, can mutational signatures be compared directly across different samples or is there bias that needs to be considered? Um, no, in principle, right? That's the, the essence, right? They should be stable. Well, right? exome versus genome, you have to, to account for abundance. Yeah, right. So if exome versus genome, or if you have a different organism, you have to take into account that the abundance could be different, right? right? Yeah. Assuming you normalize for trinucleotide abundance, mutational signatures are extremely stable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have one res another response to to Emily that a, a skin punch is a good choice, but I, I think from Emily's statement, it wasn't no longer it was no longer available. Um, and then uh, we're close to the end here. Ahmed asked um, in WGS, where does a mutational signature dominate coding or non coding regions? Is there a common pattern? Sorry, in in, in exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. Genome, WGS, sorry, I don't know if I said it, in, in whole genome sequencing. Uh, that is a it's good a landscape question. question, basically, right? I mean, yeah, it is a, I, I think Ferran will, will shed more light on this. Right, yeah. I will uh, right. nominate Ferran to uh, <laughs> cover yeah. this. Deflate the question. Uh, well, you, usually we see more mutations in, in the non coding, uh, non coding part. So, um, the short answer to that would be uh, it's it's the non-coding which dominates because it's the it's the it's the part which covers uh, the most part of the genome. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, well, yeah. Regarding the signature or the on the background mutagenesis, we 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 always uh, try to um, try to use the whole genome data to to build this background mutagenesis model, this neutral mutagenesis model in in in, in cancer. I, I would always uh, talk about background and, and, and neutral, but I really mean neutral, uh, which is not subject to positive selection. So that, that would be the short answer to that. If I can add to that, right? So there's also mechanistic reasoning, right? So inside functional genes, you have biological selection pressure, which reduced mutation count slightly. Uh, the bigger factor is transcription coupled nucleotide excision repair, which causes a dramatically lower amount of mutations from adducts on transcribed strands if the gene is actively transcribed. Except for type 2 a mutants. <laughs> sometimes we have no choice because we have just uh, exome, exome data. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's just the way it is, right? But, but and you, know, right? you know why you expect less mutations in transcribed regions because of TCNER. Yeah. Assuming there is a mutational process there which is affected by TCNER, a lot of mutational processes are not. So again, right, it very much depends on what the mutagenesis is that is ongoing in that particular sample. Okay. Uh, so Samuel asked a good question also. Um, can't we just use um, signature extraction to find the background 
uh, uh, signature in untreated cells. Uh, uh, sorry, in a cell, sorry. I think I'm getting a little tired. Uh, in a cell line experiment, why can't we just do standard signature extraction to find which is the background and which is the its target signature? I'm assuming with signature extraction, you mean NMF or a comparable method? I, I think that's, yeah. You can, this is definitely true, right? Uh, the complication is, right, normally we don't sequence 10 clones for a compound. We did quite a few for cisplatin, so that might have worked, but for most compounds we screen, we only do two or three. And doing NMF and getting a pure mutation signature out of so few clones is very difficult. Just the method is not sensitive enough. Yeah, okay, yep. Right. Uh, and then I think we're down to the final question now. David wants to know how does how does uh, how do we account for within tumor header uh, sorry between tumor heterogeneity david did you mean between it between I tumor heterogeneity I, i'm what? guessing no. yeah inter inter that's um within, within uh, no no without that's um okay between tumors. tumor yeah between okay between tumors okay um well, that's basically the question of signature assignment, right? So once you know the mutational signatures that are present in a cohort, because you have done NMF and found mutational signatures, then for every tumor individually, you assign mutational signatures, right? And then some tumors will have, for example, aflatoxin mutagenesis and some will not. Is that what you're asking? It's a little bit clear, but I was trying to look at it from this perspective because um, I, I've learned that, uh, like within tumor, there are different cells have um, different mutations. So, and if we are, if we use a cell, how do we know that the the genome for that cell can be representative for the entire tumor population? Is that clear? Uh, yeah. I think so. So, you might, a tumor is a constant dynamic of cells trying to grow faster than the others, right? As a result, you always have clonal expansions and there will always be mutations which are present in a lot of the tumor cells and there will also always be mutations that are present in a smaller proportion of the tumor cells. Okay. Um, so, during signature, right? So, the mutational spectrum of a tumor is just the total of all those mutations. But you can try to look at the variant of the frequency of certain mutations assigned to certain mutational processes, and then try mm -hmm. to delineate whether a mutational process occurred in the beginning of tumor genesis, so it's present in most of tumor cells, or at the end, where you see very low variant of the frequency, and it means it's only later in tumor genesis. I would right. also uh, yeah. point out one thing that we don't really sequence single cells, right? We sequence a lot of cells. We don't really have a technology very easily lets us, that very easily lets us sequence single cells. So the standard is we're sequencing quite a lot of cells every time. And so a lot of the heterogeneity is averaged out. And the oh, only okay. way we can see it is by the variant allele frequency. So mutations that are only in a few cells will have low variant allele frequency. And mutations okay. that are in all the cells will have high variant allele frequency. PAF. BAF, right. Okay. Variant allele. That's right, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're out of questions, I think. Uh, well, okay, yes, I think we're out. Yeah. Um, so I think we should take a break on out uh, because people will have to leave their computers briefly to get yes. a snack or, uh, yeah. Uh, so shall we uh, say 10 minutes? I don't know. Uh, 10 minutes, I think is good. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And that then you'll pres then you'll present the information on the practicum. Is that? Yes. And we'll set up breakout rooms. Okay. 10 minutes. Okay. See you soon. Okay. See you. Yeah.
Okay, shall we continue? Um, I hope everybody's back. Um, so we will move on to the first practicum of this tutorial, uh, which will be uh, a practice analysis of mutational signature elucidation from experimental data. Um, so we will do, uh, we will start with analyzing some mutation data uh, that we have generated previously. And we will then use our latest scripts to separate the background mutagenesis in the cell lines from the true signal to try to clean up our experimental signature data. And we will basically try to answer two, two questions. Does background subtraction improve similarity between the experimental data and the signature extra extracted from human tumors? And is there a difference between the meditational signatures of cisplatin, carboplatin, and oxaliplatin? Um, so just to reiterate about background, right? So these are the mutations that we see consistently in our experimental model. Um, so this is actually data we generated separately. So these are control populations. Uh, on the right of the slide here, let me switch to the pointer type thingy. Uh, where is the... I can't find my pointer type thingy button. <laughs> uh, no, okay. Hey, when did I exit the full screen? Ah, here. Ah, okay. Back in business. Okay, right. So on the right of the screen here, there's the experimental design that we always use. So we start with a uh, petri dish full of cells, which are presumably clonal. Uh, we expose them for eight weeks to compounds. Usually we add fresh compounds after every three or four days. So we basically give them a new fresh mutagenic compound twice a week. Uh, then we give those cells, after those eight weeks, we give them a little bit of time to recover because usually they're not very happy at this stage. Uh, then we pick a single cell from this and we grow this out. So we have a lot of cells so we can isolate plenty of DNA for uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, and this background data we're using here is the result of three independent clones that we have processed in this way, only we didn't actually add anything that should cause mutations. Um, so, um, and like we discussed, right, so this background mutagenesis is basically the result of the fact that these cells are alive uh, and that they're dividing, they're replicating their DNA. Um, thus, the background levels change depending on how long you expose and how many cell divisions occur during this time. Because we can also imagine that if you put something very mutagenic on the cells and they're very not happy, that they divide a lot slower than if you wouldn't treat them with anything mutagenic. So the le background level, right? We can't assume that the background level is the same in all population, right? Therefore, we are sampling, right? We devised a script where we sample from a negative binomial distribution of levels of background, uh, which is centered on the level of background that we actually, actually see in these control populations. And then, right, so we, sam right, we randomly sample from this negative binomial distribution, we add that to the clones and then try to see, try to filter out a stable non-background signal. Because of this approach, we cannot actually, our function does not work on a single clone. So we always need two data points to try to extract the signature. Um, and we're using a maximum likelihood model using numerical optimization. I will not go into the details, this is something that looks very scientific. Uh, it's in the, uh, in the manual of the package we'll be using. So you can check that later for details. If there's any questions about that, you can just ask. Um, so there's, 
this is just an example. So this is uh, exposure data cells, HEP2 cells exposed to a nitrosamine, NDEA, and diethylamine. Um, so we see we have two clones. The mutation loads are fairly comparable. Um, and we have a background spectrum of HEP2, which we experimentally determined. And then when we do background subtraction, right, so we attribute background spectrum at different levels and try to get a stable end signature. Um, and we can plot this like this. And if we, right, so we attribute it background to the mutational spectra. So you can see that these patterns are identical to these original tumor spectrum, but a percentage of e each peak is actually concluded to be background signature and not true signal. So we see that in this exposure, right? So we see in HEP2, we have quite a lot of C2A mutations already. And you see that in the signature, uh, in the spectra, you have a lot of C2A mutations also, but these are actually quite for a fairly large proportion caused by uh, the background and not the mutagenic compounds that we used. Whereas the T2A and T2C mutation are actually not that much background, it's more true signal. And then in the end, right, so if you take only these gray bars, you can basically conclude what the true signature looks like, right? So that's what we'll be doing, right? So we'll, uh, you'll be given uh, mutation data from exposed cells, actually not this one, but cisplatin data. Um, you will be given the background. You can assign the background to the mutation spectra and then calculate the, the mutational signature without the background. Uh, we'll be studying data from three different compounds, uh, cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaliplatin. So these are three very commonly used chemotherapeutics. Um, Cisplatin and carboplatin give the same adduct, uh, and oxaliplatin gives the same adduct as ormaplatin, but ormaplatin, we have no actual uh, experiment. Arnav, can I just, um, where did you, where's the link to the, um, the questions in the practicum? Uh, well, when, I, when we go there, I will show it. Oh, you haven't showed it yet. Okay. No? <laughs> okay. I was trying to ask her a question in the Slack. Sorry, thanks. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, not there. Uh, just a second. It's the next slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, so we, you will be given data. Uh, we have prepared a Word document with instructions. So I will, uh, so it's this dot one practicum one uh, doc X. I will in the chat of the Zoom as well as the, um, uh, sorry, uh, as well uh, in the Zoom as well as the Slack, I will point. Uh, uh, I will paste the link to the GitHub page in case people have not found that yet. So yeah, the practicum pages are near the bottom of the GitHub page. The inputs, but not the questions. Yeah. Oh, the input. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the inputs uh, are on the GitHub page. Um, if you want, I can put the questions on the you GitHub page. Otherwise, just put your, share your screen and. Uh, if you want. But here, I just put the I just put the inputs in the Slack, and then I'll share my screen too. Hold on. Hold on. Yes. So both the questions and the input data are on the. Uh, Jess, Jessica, could you just post the question link? I don't. I can I don't see it right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I was already doing it, but- We got it, Jeff. Usually the students are better at us than we are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it's okay, annoying how, how bad computational biologists are with computers. Yes. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but- uh... Uh, No, that's okay. Uh, okay, so that's basically what we'll be doing. Uh, the document should have enough details, but we'll go into breakout sessions now. So you, we'll you were just talking that. about the oxaliplatin and the cisplatin. Did you finish your slides? That's okay. 